Hello and welcome to the Chiaroscuro Jazz Podcasts. I'm George Graham, Director of Artistry and Repertoire for the Venerable Jazz Label, which for over a half century has been presenting music from some of the world's great jazz musicians. In this series, we'll have conversations by some of today's outstanding players and their thoughts on some of the artists who have recorded for Chiaroscuro. This time it's saxophonist, conductor, jazz historian, and educator Lauren Schoenberg. With a fascinating biography in his teens, Schoenberg was playing with the Duke Ellington and Count Basie bands and also formed his own big band, which became the last Benny Goodman Orchestra. He's the senior scholar at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. He's on the faculty at the Juilliard School of Music and has also taught at the Manhattan School of Music and the New School. He's won two Grammy Awards for liner notes. He has released eight albums of his own groups and in his youth was also on hand for recording sessions for one of Buck Clayton's jam session albums on Chiaroscuro. I started by asking him about which came first, his interest in the history of music or in playing it. Well, it's funny, you know, there really was never any separation for me with my interest in the music and the history of it. Uh, They were both hand in glove. Uh, Even though um, I've taught at many schools, and I even wound up in the graduate department of the school I never graduated from, you know, those two things were really never separated for me. Uh, I, my interest in the music and in the history of the music and the people who made it really kind of developed hand in glove. Uh, I'm really not an academic, uh, although I've taught in universities. I never, I don't have a bachelor's degree. I actually dropped out to go work for Benny Goodman before that happened. But I wound up teaching in the graduate school of the school I never graduated from. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not thought to be an academic. But uh, but as an historian, yeah, sure. So. Uh, I started reading books about the music. I started playing the music. And long story short, uh, in the early 1970s, there was a place in New York called the New York Jazz Museum. And I started working there as a volunteer uh, 51 years ago. And so when I was there, I actually met, you know, all these musicians from the 1920s and 30s, and even some who went back further than that, believe it or not. And so it was never separated. And then I started playing music and started playing with them and, and eventually went to school and became mentored by Eddie Durham and and and, and others. So for me, uh, there was never really a, um, a separation. Did, did the history come before the playing? I fell in love with this music because, um, well, I started liking even older music than jazz. And then my local public library had a record, the Benny Goodman Carnegie Hall concert from 1938. And I just fell in love with the band. I fell in love with the, with the way Benny Goodman and the band sounded. And also on that concert uh, was Lester Young. And I kind of fell in love with the way he played the saxophone. So I was I already played piano. I picked up the saxophone. And Teddy Wilson, who played on that concert, was actually playing in a restaurant in Hackensack, New Jersey, just about a 20 minute drive from my hometown in Fairlawn. And I got to know him and my parents got to know him. And I studied informally with him and with another pianist from New Jersey named Hank Jones, who was one of the great jazz pianists. And so it was just hand in glove as I was reading about the stuff, I was meeting the people. And so it was all just kind of very natural. There was no division between studying it, going to the library and taking out a book. And then playing that night with the guys from Duke Ellington's or Count Basie's band and asking them questions about it because I had read this. And and then kind of that's how it, it evolved very naturally. Hmm. Interesting that uh, so many, uh, many jazz musicians I know uh, go in whole hog for playing and and then the history comes in. Then the, the, uh, uh, the academic part comes in. But the, for you, it's been pretty much both feet in all the way. Well, for me, it wasn't history. It was the people that I knew. So uh, because I was going to be on a bandstand with these people from the 20s and 30s, and there was no division. It was almost as though, I'll tell you, it's funny now that I think about it because your questions are so interesting, that it was almost as though I had come along in those days as a young musician. And so most of the musicians of my generation were not interested in Joe Jones or Sonny Greer or Eddie Durham or Dickie Wells or people like that. They were chasing the people of that era, which would be the 1970s. Uh, 
but for whatever reason, I was attracted to this music. So yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I remember once I was interviewing Art Farmer, many, obviously many years ago, and he got off on the point that, you know, in the schools now, you know, we have to teach them to play Louis Armstrong solos and to sing them and Lester Young and Coleman Hawkins. And, you know, you learn them and you play them and you and we analyze them. Back in those days, he said, you know, we didn't analyze anything. We didn't have to go to school for it because that's the music that was in the air. So they heard Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington and Lester Young. They heard it seven days a week. So, it, you know, you know, so just kind of all very natural. Well, you you described a couple of people that uh, that uh, were influential to you. Teddy Wilson being a great uh, pianist, and uh, actually he recorded for Kiaris Gura a couple of albums. As a matter of fact, um, who would be some of your other mentors in in the uh, you know when you're getting started, especially when you started getting into the big bands, playing in the in the sections. Well, um, I would say Benny Goodman, Benny Carter, Buck Clayton, uh, John Lewis, uh, Jimmy Heath. Um, and then more obscure figures, a guy named Doc Wheeler, who had a band back in the 30s. And I actually rehearsed with Sam Wooding. If you know that name, Sam Wooding had a band that went to Europe in 1926. And it's not that I was such a good musician, I don't think. I think it's because there were not that many people, in the 18, 19 years old or whatever, who were interested in that music. So it's just that they were looking, well, I knew those things. Um of course, I was very aware of Chiaro Oscuro for any number of reasons. First of all, uh, two of the people who mentored me early on were a guy named Jack Bradley, who used to run the Jazz Museum in New York, and Ruby Braff. And so at that time, Ruby had just recorded an album, of course. My parents had taken me to see the original Benny Goodman Quartet uh, at Carnegie Hall, 1973, I think it was. And the opening act was the Ruby Braff George Barnes Quartet. So, of course, I went out and bought their album. And it was on Chiaroscuro. And I was also very close at that time with Dan Morgenstern. He was one of my early mentors. So it was kind of just like I had all these Chiaro School records, including Ruby Braff and his International Jazz Quartet Plus One, where he plays Swan Lake. Uh, I had all the Chiaro School records. And Hank Jones, when I was studying with him, took me to a date, uh, one of the Buck Clayton Jam Session dates. I have a picture of it. I was there as a teenager, so I knew very much about Chiaro Scuro personally. Uh, and those other people were my mentors, I would say. Right. And that brings us to, I was going to ask you about this, uh, your memories of that session from the Buck Clayton Jam session that we recently reissued on Chiaro Scuro. I remember it so vividly, because at that point I was already very much into Lester Young, and uh, I hadn't played with Earl Warren yet, but I was going to. He became very important to me and, and a good friend of my parents and it was he was on the record date along with bud johnson and along with joe temperley i believe and also lee konitz and it was fascinating because lee konitz is such a lester young disciple and the, his great quotes about lester young uh, you know about the sound of of lester young and the count basie band like he, he had this quote where he said to think how many lives that influenced and here I was as a teenager already, my life was influenced by this stuff. So to see Lee, along with Vic Dickinson and Harry Sweets Edison, and the guys who had played with Lester Young, uh, also there was Jimmy Nepper, who I, again, got to know and, and record with in later years, uh, and uh, Milt Hinton, and, uh, you know, just a, a wonderful band, and um, Marvin Hannibal Peterson, which is very interesting because he was a very, I guess at that point you'd call him an avant-garde trumpet player. And I remember saying to myself like, man, how is he going to fit in playing chord changes and, and playing with Harry Sweets Edison? But you know, the way that Hank O'Neill put it all together 
and the choice of the musicians that he did in concert with Buck and probably also with Nancy Miller Elliott may have played a hand in there too. Uh, it just worked magic. And if you had told me at that moment that someday I'd be in Buck Clayton's big band, I mean, I never would have believed it in a moment. And I'll tell you one other thing I remember about it, which was that, and it's a lesson I tell my students about. Hank Jones loved to play the piano with the soft pedal on, uh, no matter whether he, you know, that's the left pedal that kind of makes for a pearly sound on a piano. And even though he used the right pedal, he didn't use the, very few jazz pianists use the middle pedal, but when he used the right pedal, and even when he was playing strong, he always had that soft pedal on. And I remember the engineer, who I assume was Fred Miller, I would think it would be him, I'm not sure who it was. Um, the, he was there, and of course the famous photographer Rollo Flex was there also. But in any case, uh, I remember the engineer running out and like looking at the piano, and he couldn't understand why, you know, like moving the mic and... And then finally, Hank said, you know, I have the soft pedal on. And I remember that so distinctly. Uh, it was amazing. I think that was the third volume, because I know that I already had a couple already at home on LP. Yes, that was that was the third one of those yeah. those uh, sessions. And uh... One of my favorites, you know, I have a couple of favorites of those records. One was um, uh, Don Ewell uh, playing with Herb Hall and Buddy Tate, uh, I believe, yeah. And then there's another one that I loved. Uh, well, there, there were so many, but the one of Mary Lou Williams with Roy Eldridge and Illinois Jaquette and Buddy Tate and Gus Johnson. Uh, oh, I, I love those records. Don't get me going on Carol School Records because I'll be here all night. I could probably talk about 50 of them. I, I, I love them because they were so unusual at that time. They were really documenting a whole tranche. I mean, not even to talk about the Earl Hines solos. You know, or the Teddy Wilson solos, you know, or just all those things uh, that that no one else was recording at that time. And, you know, there's such an art into producing records. And and now I know as having had my own records and, and been on other people's records and seen how Bill Cosby totally screwed up a record date once, you know, uh, and not not to get into Bill Cosby, but I just mean as somebody as a, as a celebrity producer to see how somebody could totally mess up a record date um, to see the the way that I guess Hank O'Neill uh, and, and and the people he worked with created an atmosphere so that you got all these masterpieces. And I have to say, I'm thrilled about the CD reissues because I'm not sure that those original press, well, the original LP pressings were okay, but man, did they sound wonderful on CD. Plus the jazz speak stuff that's been added, which are a very essential element uh, of jazz oral history. And I use them with my students all the time. Hmm. Yeah, because we've reissued a number of those or, or actually turned those into one of our early series of podcasts uh, basically, I extracted those and and uh, turned them into the first uh, series of podcasts. But now, in the second season of podcasts, we're talking with real live people <laughs> from uh, <laughs> from uh, who who recall the dates, who recall the the music and the influence uh, uh, that uh, that led to these to these records. It's interesting. I find your insight uh, very uh, illuminating. Not having been at those sessions myself, but knowing Hank as well as I do. He's fairly modest in his, um, the way he talks about what he did on the sessions, but he really was very influential. And, and uh, I think his philosophy was to take advantage of the talent of the artists while it's still around. Absolutely. I mean, if you subtract the chiaroscuro discography from the jazz of that era and the musicians that he recorded, uh, there's nothing to take its place. I mean, you know, there were some labels in France, black and blue, and, uh, you know, there there were sessions here and there, uh, but nothing remotely uh, like the legacy of Chiaroscuro. Nothing remotely like it. And also, I have to remember that there were things on that label that were not uh, what you would call mainstream jazz. Uh, you know, he really... <laughs> and that's what I think people really don't know about. I, I, I think people know, like, the center of the Chiaroscuro catalog. And that's why your podcast series is so important. Uh, but you know what's in the left hand, right hand, bottom left hand corner of what of what they were recording. Uh, really, really fascinating. Yeah, well, our, our biggest sellers are the two fusion albums by James Mason and by Tarika. We've issued those on vinyl and uh, they sell out immediately. Well, I would say the history of the label is equally interesting to the history of Hank O'Neill, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> but he's what I would call modest to a fault. I mean, if you talk to him, uh, 
you would think that like he wasn't even there you know but then you sometimes you've issued uh you know there are little warm-up things i remember like was it earl hines and joe venuti i think or something like that like where there's an outtake of a track or where there's a a thing it's i it's so interesting because you really get an insight as to what was happening between you know and now you think about it you're talking about people on the mount rushmore of jazz and here they are you can hear them the joe venuti records i mean joe venuti and zoot sims with cliff lehman and dick wellstead i mean forget it <laughs> it's unbelievable and then you think about you know like if you think of jazz like a crossword puzzle uh and you just put these names in and you start to say well where's earl hines in the history of the music and what did he contribute in 1927 and 1928, you know? And then you go up to some of the younger musicians, you know, that were captured, Bill Sharlap, especially if you go to the things that were recorded uh, on the jazz cruise. And by the way, I don't know how they got that sound, but I've been listening to the Gene Burton Cini trio record with Bill Sharlap and, uh, and, and Sean Smith. And uh, I mean, the sound quality on top of the musical quality, uh, you know, uh, it, it it it's so far superior to so many of the albums that won all the Grammy awards and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's really amazing. You know? Yeah, I know that John Bates spent a lot of time working out the system for recording on deck with the engines in the background and all of that kind of stuff. So it worked. <laughs> amazing, amazing. <laughs> of course, there's Clark Terry. There's another giant who was a frequent chiaroscuro artist. Yeah, and Benny Carter, and Flip Phillips, and Al Gray, and Kenny Deverne, and uh, the list goes on. <laughs> right. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about your own musical project. You've led some bands and um, uh, had several albums. Uh, are there particular ones that you felt particularly uh, gifted to be able to, to do? I went to work for Benny Goodman in 1980. And around that time, I had been in a series of big bands in New York. There, I guess what you call like dance bands. And scattered through them, you know, there were some really good musicians. But um, it was just, it, it, the, we played the charts. We never rehearsed them. And it was kind of sloppy. So I started to put a big band together. And um, Benny Goodman said that I could use a handful of his charts. So I did. And then uh, Buck Clayton and John Carisi and other people that I was working with or getting to know, the, there really wasn't a big band that wanted to play the kind of music that I wanted to play at that time. And so we started rehearsing and things, and then Mel Lewis joined the band, mm. uh, who was like a great mentor, of course, and a, one of the great drummer band leaders of all time. But he was interested in it. And once he did, and that word started to get around, um, then... And it was just a re what we call a rehearsal band. Um, I could get pretty much anybody I wanted. So it was a very unique combination of young musicians at that time, like Ted Nash and Ken Poplowski and Doug Lawrence and Randy Sankey and James Chirillo. And I don't know, you know, all my friends um, and the older cats like Mel and Danny Bank and Jimmy Nepper and Harold Ashby and all kinds of people. And then uh, we made a record. In 1984 called that's the way it goes and benny heard that record and then we became the last benny goodman big band uh he hired us in toto and we wound up uh on a 1985 pbs special called let's dance and then uh, he passed away in 1986 and by the way i got fired from my own band which is <laughs> a wonderful experience i recommend it for everybody and uh, not fired, but, you know, he, he reshuffled the pre, he was always changing people. And then, uh, then it was a combination of playing in my band, and my band was always a special events kind of thing. In other words, we did one tour, we played the Village Vanguard, we played the Blue Note, we played a lot for the New York Swing Dance Society in its early days. Uh, and I know many couples who actually met at those dances, actually. Uh, and... Then, uh, and making records, and I'm proud of the records, and they were mostly for the Music Masters label. Uh, 
and there are several, I guess. And then, um, and then we did a record for TCB, a Swiss label called Out of This World. And then we did one with Ken Poplowski uh, on Concord. And then we did uh, one with Barbara Lee. So there were a handful of records. And I'm no more proud of any one of them than than any of the others because they're all they all have interesting things on them. And then at the same time, uh, I started recording with Benny Carter and John Lewis and uh, and uh, Christian McBride's big band. That's a little bit later, and Jimmy Heath, Tom Talbert had a very interesting band, and so you know it was it was a a combination. And then a few years after that, um, I became Bobby Short's musical director for about eight years. And we made albums with him, sometimes with a sextet, and then sometimes with a, a larger big band. And those were for Telarc, I believe. Uh, and then um, then I also made a lot of records kind of in the Ben Webster, Lester Young chair, so to speak, of the American Jazz Orchestra with John Lewis uh, and Benny Carter, and then also with the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra, which made many records. And then around the same time, I was coming in and I was conducting uh, Link, uh, Wynton Marsalis's band, the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, on occasion. I mean, he was the conductor. And in those days, he used to stand in front of the band and conduct it. And then there were a handful of us who would come in and do a concert at Lincoln Center or go out on the road with them when Wynton couldn't do it. Eventually, they evolved into a conductorless band, almost like the Orpheus Chamber ensemble. In other words, there's nobody in front of the band most of the time. They, you know. Uh, so that was a very, very busy period. I would say that would be the mid 80s through the mid 2000s. The last big band that I was in, uh, that I made records and played a solo on and stuff was Christian McBride's big band. And I was in that band up until about five or six years ago. So big bands have been a, a large part of my life. You know, I always felt that um, jazz started as basically an ensemble music and the arrangers and the composers were like the trunk of a tree. And they created this music that had a lot of form and structure to it and orchestration and arrangement. And then the soloists were like the little branches that grew out of that tree. Then you have a Charlie Parker and name all the great jazz soloists, you know, but I do feel that um, there's too many people standing on those little branches and not enough work going into the trunk of the tree. And so now almost everyone who's think, uh, who's a jazz musician uh, is marketed as and prepares themselves for a career as a soloist with a small group. And in my opinion, you know, there's not that many players that I want to go here for a whole night doing nothing but improvise with a rhythm section. I mean, there are some, uh, but there are many that uh, I think could really use that formal structure of more arrangements uh, and and more instruments. Now, you know, that, that that goes against the grain of what's happening economically in the world. You know, you, you, that's why the big bands died along with the dinosaurs, you know. But, uh, but, but nonetheless, you know, like you listen to the modern jazz quartet or you listen to when Wynton Marsalis had that wonderful septet that he had back in the early 90s, uh, you know, and other musicians. There's a wonderful musician named Ambrose Akamensori now. And I say young, he's probably 40 now. But, you know, you know, there's all kinds of people who are very much involved in arranging and composition and seeing the solos as, as these things that grow out of it. And I kind of, I don't lament it because you can't lament it any more than, well, you could say, do I lament glo global warming? That's a talk for another time. But I, 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 I think the one reason that jazz has really evolved to such a teeny weeny passion for so few people and we have to confront that in, in the world. You know, how many people actually listen to it? How many people will support a station like this? You know, they'll listen to it. And if you say to them, okay, I want you to take a dollar out of your pocket every day to listen to, to WVIA, right? Or to contribute or something like that. Take a buck out of your pocket and put it on the on top of the radio or on top of the computer. They do it in a second. But they don't, unfortunately. Most people don't. And we love the ones who do. And in the same sense, you know, you have to look at jazz, you know, uh, very uh, realistically and try and figure out why don't more people want to listen to it. And that's why a station like this and a show like this and what you folks do uh, is so vital to the ecosphere and the uh, the uh, economic world of jazz, which is getting the music out there. And thank God, you know, I'm happy to be associated with you folks. Well, great. Uh, speaking of getting the music out there, 
cultivating a younger generation, I think, is some, an important thing that you're doing uh, in your academic work. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, you know, you work with Juilliard and uh, and uh, other academic institutions. Well, around 2000, in the year 2000, I was approached by Leonard Garment uh, that we're going to build the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. And so uh, Christian McBride became my co-director, and John Batiste eventually was a student at Juilliard. He came in, and he's, he's the other artistic director. And we started doing programming, and uh, we're now over 20 years old. We're a Smithsonian affiliate. And I learned from that more than anything else that unless you integrate younger people into the audience, um, it's a losing game. And so at one point, uh, we would, you know, because we had a, a group of regulars, and the group of regulars, uh, it was in Harlem, so it, it maybe was more racially integrated than than most of the jazz audience usually is. But uh, it was older. They'd go to a jazz club. I mean, just who's there for the most part? And we started saying, jokingly, but half, half seriously, you can't come back unless you bring somebody under 30. <laughs> And, you know, uh, people laughed, and, you know, but then they started doing it, or at least they tried to do it. And this is vital to the jazz experience. So I bumped into teaching totally by accident. Uh, I was working with a singer named Sylvia Sims, and she had a trio with Fred Hirsch on piano. Steve Lespina played the bass, and I played the saxophone. This is about th over 30 years ago. And to make a long story short, um, Fred was teaching at the new school. Fred asked me to substitute teach for him one class. I loved it, even though, as you know, I didn't have a bachelor's degree, although I had sent, I had spent five years in school, but left to work with Benny Goodman, then left to work with Benny Carter. Um, and I went and taught a class for him. And I really liked it. So I called him back and I said, hey, would you mind if I asked them if they had another opening? He says, I don't care. I'm going to, it's no skin off my, whatever it would be a skin off of. No problem. So uh, I started teaching. And in my first class was Brad Meldow and, and some other people. So I began learning that that old cliche about a teacher learns more than the students, which just sounds like one of those things that people say it really is true. Because with having Brad in the class and then John Batiste and all the other students I've had throughout the years, they're much greater musicians than I am. But that doesn't mean that there's something that I can't teach them, that there's things I know that they don't know. So um, teaching became a real passion of mine. And so I followed it through. I taught at Manhattan School of Music for a long time. I taught at the New School and other schools. And then eventually uh, in 2001, they started the jazz program at Juilliard. So Wynton Marsalis reached out to me and asked if I would like to uh, teach the jazz history program there and kind of put my thumbprint on it, so to speak. Um, and I did, and I'm still there. And so through that, uh, and thank God, uh, I've, I've been able to have kind of my my finger on the pulse, so to speak, of the young musicians coming up and hearing through them, like, who's really good and what they can do. One observation that I see, uh, and I've had some experience with younger musicians, especially in connection with the Delaware Water Gap Jazz Festival, which had for many years the Coda Cats assembling a high school uh, band. Phil Woods started that. And... Um, sort of an all-star band from high, of high school. And then some of these people go on to, you know, significant jazz careers. Uh, two of the people in Dave Liebman's band were Coda Cats, for example. Um, and I find the, just in, in my, from my observation, the young people are a lot more serious about music than past generations. Would you agree with that? No. I mean, how, how, how can you be more serious about music than Art Tatum and John Bunch and Zoot Sims and Pepper Adams? I mean, they were very serious about the music. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I know what you mean, and let me answer it positively. Um, you know, it's funny. You mentioned the name Phil Woods. <laughs> Phil Woods was at a jazz thing I went to at Ramapo College back 50 years ago. And he was famous for this remark where he was like talking about all these jazz camps and jazz programs. He says, I'll tell you what you should do. You get a bunch of kids in the most beautiful uh, setting up in the Berkshire somewhere. Every morning you get them on a bus at 7 a.m., drive around for 12 hours, then let them out and play, then back on the bus. <laughs> and they'll really learn what it's like to be a musician. He was such a great mentor. In fact, he was a mentor to one of the young musicians I met and wound up in my band. And now he's 
you know, he must be 50 or something like that. But John Gordon, uh, who also has an album on Chiaroscuro, uh, 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 John was a disciple of Phil Woods's. Uh, you know, it's funny. The jazz musicians of today, I can understand why someone would say that they're more serious uh, than the older ones. Yes, it's true in a, in a sense. Um, in the old days and even in my days, uh, coming up in the in the seventies, there was a large jazz community, and there were a lot of gigs, and you played all the time. I mean, I go back and look at my date book from the nineteen seventies or early eighties. I mean, I'm playing seven nights a week uh, with all different kinds of people. So now the young musicians, their world isn't that world. Their world is the world of probably going to a jazz school and learning it in the school and going to a conservatory. And so, of course, on, on the surface of it, it's more serious because uh, there's not the large world to be in 24-7 where, man, you heard this guy play this night and the next night, and you took a lesson in the afternoon, and, and you went to school, but the school was just kind of to get it through with. Now, the school really has taken the place of the huge jazz scene, and because of that, and because the music is is so, the people that they're studying aren't around anymore for the most part. And it really is a music that has a lot to do with the past in a certain way uh, that it calls for a different kind of person. But I can tell you, come into my jazz, my 9 a.m. jazz history class or some of these rehearsals, they're serious, but they're also still just crazy kids. And the young musicians are just as just as free spirited as the old ones. But it's a different day and a different time. Thanks to Lauren Schoenberg for sharing his thoughts and insights. Let's go out with a track from the Buck Clayton Jam Session album where Lauren was in attendance and which we recently remastered and issued on CD and digital for the first time. This is the title track, Jazz Party Time. Thank you. 
Jazz Party Time from the Buck Clayton Jam Session 3 album, recently remastered and reissued by Chiaroscuro. You can find information on this and over a hundred other titles on Chiaroscuro on our website at chiaroscurojazz.org, where you can find more of these podcasts. And why not subscribe to the Chiaroscuro podcasts wherever you get your podcasts? This is George Graham, your producer for the Chiaroscuro podcast series. Thanks for sharing your time with us.